Hi folks, welcome to this video and as you can see it's titled Socio-Cultural Factors Affecting Sport in Post-Industrial Britain, i.e. Post-1850. So, if you've watched the video on like, what was Britain like sport-wise pre-1850, pre-Industrial Revolution, we're now looking at how the Industrial Revolution, as well as other factors, impacted on the uh, opportunities to take part in sport and pastimes in Britain at this time. So this is post-1850, post-Industrial Revolution. So I'm going to deal with this in parts again, and there is going to be a second video to go alongside this, looking specifically at the impact of something called the public school system in England. Um, but I'm going to deal with the impacts of the Industrial Revolution first. So what has the Industrial Revolution got to do with sport in the UK? Think back to the opening ceremony, London 2012 Olympics, and Danny Boyle's uh, uh, thing that he did, where you know gr England started off as like a green, pleasant land, trees, things like that. You know it to be different. You know it may not be that pleasant. You know, you're upper class or working class, and the majority of people were working class. But then he changed the landscape, didn't he? He brought on the Industrial Revolution. Everything became industrialised. We're going to look at how that impacts on your on people's opportunity to take part in sport. So if you think back to the opening ceremony for London 2012, like I said, it started off green and pleasant, but then, you know, we saw industry start to be built. What happens is we start to develop towns and cities in England and in the UK. And those towns and cities are based on specific industries. So, you know, Sheffield became the steel manufacturing capital of the country. Manchester was very big on cotton. Um, so, you know, developing pottery and things like that. Um, you know, look, a lot of your towns in the north became mining towns, you know, to, you know, get coal out the ground to fuel the Industrial Revolution. So whereas before this, the population was spread out across quite a rural green landscape, now we're getting pockets of people coming together uh, to live in cities. So what happens is the upper classes start to invest in these new industries because they want to make even more money. They want to become even wealthier. Whereas a lot of the working classes who used to work on the farming land are now moving to the towns and cities to get jobs in these factories in the hope of better pay, in the hope of shorter hours. Didn't actually work out that way and it didn't change for a long, long time. But what happens is everyone moves in those directions towards these cities and we call this process urbanisation. People start to move towards the cities and we start to get pockets of people living together, hundreds, thousands of people living together. Whereas before the Industrial Revolution, the population was spread out relatively evenly across the UK. Something that the Industrial Revolution did, which is a bit weird, because people are now working in factories and industry, they're working more regular hours. So there's now a clearer distinction between work time and leisure time. Whereas when you worked on the farms, you, you had to do the jobs when, you know, the sun was up or, you know, depending on the weather, whether it was, you know, you know, chucking it down outside or nice and bright or whatever. So it, there was very little distinction between what was your leisure time and what was your work time. Whereas when people are working in factories, there's a cl clocking in time and a clocking off time. The upper classes still had a lot more opportunity to play sport because they're rich, they're loaded, they don't need to, they're in charge of everything, they're running everything, but they're not actually doing any of the hard labour. So they've got more time and more money to take part in sport. Whereas the working classes, even though I've said here they moved, you know, to the cities for better pay and lower hours, it didn't work out that way. They still work to what's called the 666 system. 6 a.m. in the morning or 6 p.m. at night, six days a week. You know, so and then Sunday was a holiday, so you had to go to church in the morning. So they've still got very limited opportunity to take part in sport. Well, this is how the Industrial Revolution starts to change the way that Britain is at this time, and obviously all aspects of Britain and sport is included in that. Now, in the last video about uh, pre-industrial Britain, pre-1850, we spoke about this idea of amateurs and professionals. So just to recap, amateurs are not people who are rubbish at sport, as some people think it means these days. These are people who didn't get paid to play. Whereas professionals are people who get paid to play. There's no difference in standards. It's just whether you're getting paid or whether you're not. Now, I've got upper and middle classes here. What happens post-1850 is we now have another class. If you think pre-1850, we only had upper class, the landowners, and working classes, the workers on the land. Now we've got middle classes. People who've got wealthy off the back of the Industrial Revolution earned quite a bit of money. Probably not as much as the upper classes, but certainly a hell of a lot more than the working classes. So they're now quite wealthy as well. Now, these two sectors play sport, but because they're wealthy, they don't need payment to play. They don't need it. They see getting paid as being vulgar anyway, because it's about pride, not about money, because they're upper classes. They're better than the rest of the people. That's their viewpoint. Now, professionals 
they were the working classes who were allowed to play certain sports such as cricket, football and rugby and they received payments to cover costs of transport and miss work. They certainly weren't getting paid just to play sport. This was, your, you earn your money through work, all we do is cover your costs to come and play sport. But obviously it's still a payment. They were an equal standard in terms of performance of the amateurs, but they were treated very, very differently. You might be thinking, why would these upper class and middle class amateurs want to mix with working class people in terms of sport? Well, because you still want to win. You still want to beat your rivals. You still want to beat, you know, your next door neighbours in terms of, you know, uh, fixtures and things like that. If I've got a better chance of playing with that very, very good working class performer in my team, then I'm going to pick them. As I said there, even though they are an equal standard in terms of performance, maybe even sometimes better than the amateurs, they were treated very, very differently. There were separate changing rooms for the upper classes and middle classes. And the work and the working classes, the, the professionals, the working classes were made to clean boots as part of their payment and tensions soon built. Look at this post there, for example, cricket lords, gentlemen versus players. In other words, amateurs versus working class professionals. Those taking part in the above match must observe the pr uh, properties of the occasion. Gentlemen, upper classes, your changing rooms are this way. Players, you're this way. Separate entries at dressing rooms are, and dressing rooms are approved. The gentlemen's rooms being strictly out of bounds to the players. Even though we are teammates, there is a clear distinction between us. Now, looking at rugby as an example as well, uh, as well as cricket, gentlemen amateurs thought the idea of professionals was too vulgar. So at this point, where there's, there's, there's going to be no mixing here. So rugby split. Why do we have rugby league and rugby union in this country? Why do we have two forms of rugby? Well, not just this country, worldwide. Well, rugby league became a very much northern sport played by the working classes, i.e. paid professionals, whereas rugby union was more southern based. And rugby union was still amateur until 1993. So rugby was developed in like the eight, mid 1800s, you know, mid to late 1800s, but it stayed amateur, you know, near enough for 150 years rugby union. They were that tight on their gentleman amateur codes, things like that. It's not about being paid, it's about representing your country, the honour and things like that. Whereas rugby league, because it was more northern based, they wanted to be more paid professionals. People had to take time off work, so they needed to be money for that. And hence why there was a split between rugby league and rugby union. And, you know, just looking at these pictures here, Sam Burgess, going back 20, 30 years, something like that, he would never have been allowed to switch codes. I mean, uh, rugby union was very strict that it would not admit any ex-rugby league players into rugby union. It didn't want anything to do with the concepts of paid professionals. But all, you know, but, and here's the key thing, we've got a picture of the NRL here. Why did we ultimately get paid professionals in rugby union? Because the Aussies, uh, the South Africans, the, uh, the, New, the Kiwis, things like that, people like that, they were very, very keen to go, well, let's just pay them. We don't, we don't have to have amateurs. We, why do we need amateurs in these sports? They didn't have this hang up on it. If we want to have the best teams, we need to pay players so that they can train full time. Whereas the English players up until 1993 were holding down jobs and then going to play for England on an evening or a weekend and their club rugby on an evening or a weekend. So, you know, they're not even getting paid to train or play for their national country or their clubs. So this is why things that ultimately do change. But it shows this hang up, this, this difference between amateurs and professionals. So what we're going to try and do now is what I did on the last video about pre-1850 is try and sum it all up together and go through, you know, the factors, you know, I've put it in the middle again, the factors affecting participation, but remember this time, post-1850, the Industrial Revolution is up and running now. So if we take them one at a time, it's the same factors as before, gender, law and order, education, literacy, time and money, transport. There's one unique one, influence of English public schools. I'm going to deal with that in a separate video. So once you've watched this one, I advise you watch the one on the influence of the English public schools and it will you know, all tie in together nicely. Right, so in no particular order then. Let's look at gender. We looked at that one last time and I'm not sure if it's fully on your screen. So I'm just going to move it in slightly just to make sure we are. So late 1800s, young British men are killed in several wars. You know, uh, so, you know during and after the Industrial Revolution, or as the Industrial Revolution has got going, all the emigrates were the parts of the British Empire. You know, at that time there's a British Empire, quite wrongly, but there is. You know, we're running quite a few other countries. So what's happening now is there's an increased role for women because there are as many men. So um, more women are put through education, 
which means that uh, more contact with sport and recreation and ultimately leads to equal rights for women. So whereas before, pre-1850, there was very little opportunity for women to take part in many sports, now there's an increased opportunity and it's getting slightly more likely that women are going to get access to sport and recreation. Right, law and order then. As we've said, we've got a new middle class developed, but we've still got the upper classes. Now, these are both wealthy. Now people are living in cities and towns. There needs to be strict laws or strict air laws. People are spread out. You need to enforce the law when there are large groups of people living close together. They become the lawmakers. And one of the things that they do is they ban lower class sports, the mob games, the bare knuckle fights, things like that. But ultimately, as you'd expect, they protect their own sports, fox hunting. So straight away, some sports are automatically banned, which reduces the opportunity to take part in those or, you know, nullifies it. Whereas other sports are still taking place. But again, the working classes are not going to take place in that. So you might argue that actually on, on some respects, women have got more equal rights to take increased sports participation. But for the working classes general, there's now been a decrease in opportunity. So in terms of education and literacy, what else has changed? Well, education was a right of the upper and middle classes. It's a way of keeping order. If you're just educating your upper and middle classes, you keep your children going into the high profile jobs and you keep the working classes where they are. You know, quite wrong, but that's the way it was at the time. So the wish to keep the lower classes uneducated, but they've got less of a voice in society is what we're saying. So they're illiterate is basically what we're saying, the working classes, they can't read or write. So if you can't read or write, you can't understand many things, including rules to upper and middle class sports, which means you can't take part in upper and middle class sports. However, 1870, something very important happens. People start to realise that it's wrong that we're denying a, set, a big sector of society the right to an education. So in 1870, there's an education act that comes in and it means that all children from 1870 onwards should have and must have access to an education. Now, obviously, the education of the upper classes is way superior to the education of the working classes, but at least it's an education. They're starting to become literate. They're starting to be able to read and write. So this meant more contact with sports in schools for lower class children and better understanding of the rules because they can now read and write a little bit. Now, as the Industrial Revolution is progressing and developing, we also see kind of a transport revolution as well, because we're making products or we're, we're digging coal up the ground or we're making steel, this, that and everything else. But we've got to move it. We've got to move it between towns and cities. So the Industrial Revolution saw the development of the railways, roads, bicycles, canals, so we can move products. But if we can move products, we can also start to move people. We can start to move players and performers. We can start to move spectators. I've put spectators. Apologies for that. I've just realised. But, um, you know, the, 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 not only can we transport things, we can transport people. Now, this isn't all happening overnight. This is happening over years and years and years. But all these are changing or, and or increasing or decreasing the opportunities of certain people to take part in sport. And I suppose the big one here is availability of time and money. We need leisure time. We need disposable income. Amateurs prevented mass participation of professionals initially. So what we're seeing is... Those upper classes and middle classes are stopping the working classes from taking part in sport. Um, apart from when it served their purpose, like we did that previous slide with the cricket, where, well, if we've got a better chance of winning by getting this young working class performing, it was quite good, then we'll get them in. But largely, the upper classes tried to suppress and stop the uh, working classes taking part in sport. They were working long hours, you know, many days a week. However, what changes again over several years, the upper and middle classes then later encourage sport in the lower classes. The lower classes who worked for them from a, for a very key point of view, it wasn't them being generous. They soon realise if we've got a healthier workforce, you know, they're fitter, you know, and they've got good communication skills and good team skills and things like that. They're more productive, which means they will make more products, which means I, as the factory owner, will make more profit. So, yeah, it might, it might seem as like, oh, finally, they're cutting on to the idea that sport is for everyone. Yeah, it's not really that, but at least it's increasing participation. So the working hours, you know, working out, uh, working long hours and pay is still low. Uh, sorry, working hours long and pay was still low. But things like the half-day Saturday law was brought in for factory workers, which frees up Saturday afternoons. Now, look at that. What's common in this country? The vast majority of football pitches, uh, fixtures, sorry, still kick off at, at 3 p.m. on a Saturday. Now, that's goes back well over 150 years, back to this time here, when they used to get time off on a Saturday afternoon to start playing regular sport, regular fixtures. So it's still a remnant today, we still see that. 
Now, I know we've mentioned education already, but this is about, you know, education mainly for the uh, working classes up here. Public schools, even though it says public, they're for the upper classes, and I'm going to deal with that in a separate video and the impacts of that. Now, it's important that you know that, you know, the impacts of the public schools in the Industrial Revolution coexisted with each other. These things were taking place at the same time, which again, massively affected sporting opportunities in the UK. But these are all the general social issues that were taking place at this time and how they affected participation. OK, so I hope you found this video useful, folks, but I advise that you now watch the video on the influence of the English public schools.